Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first session of Tears of the Father by our dear brother, Mark Templer. Thank you very much, Mark, for always sharing your wisdom, experience, and lessons with us. Also for contributing your time and effort for, with us. We are always looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we can see that the Bible is encouraging us to know Jesus and our hope from this time with Mark is that we know something new about Jesus by the time we are done. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can meet even through this platform. We thank you for uh, your Jesus and the cross. We thank you for our brother Mark and with, with his wisdom and always sharing that knowledge with us. Thank you for everyone present here. We know that today is a working day. Thank you for everyone here. We ask you, God, to encourage our heart and soul, to help us to understand your word. Help us to hear and apply to our life. Be with everyone trying to connect. And I know the number is less. And they are coming back from their uh, work. So be with everyone. Help us again to understand your word and focus on you only. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So um, uh, thank you so much for uh, being willing to talk to me, all of you. And uh, I pray that uh, we can have a great time together. And so this uh, this series is actually kind of a, the beginning of of what would be the final book I will write in my life. I am um, uh, when I was younger, I wrote the prayers of the the prayer um, the the prayer of the righteous, and then um, later I wrote the cross of the savior. And I've always had in my mind to have a third book, and for a long time I've thought that the title should be the tears of the father, and. Uh, I've realized, and I keep trying to read the Bible, like I hope we all are. And um, you know, I've seen um, passages like Genesis six, where it says God's heart was filled with pain when He saw the suffering of the world. But um, uh, what I really thought of, in particular, was uh, the story, the stories of the patriarchs, and in particular, the story of uh, Joseph and Jacob, and uh, and so. That's the that's kind of what this series is going to be about, but it's going to start with um uh, this with with um the the story of the first patriarch of all of them, whose name many of us don't even know. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here just for a moment, and I hope that we can learn something together. And I'm very grateful for being invited. I, I'm praying for a number of you and your kids every day. And, and I pray even today, as you're tired from work and maybe exhausted, maybe you got yelled at, or maybe you didn't make your sales goals, but I pray that today we can just think about God and about the amazing wisdom he gives us in the scriptures. So we're going to start. I've just shared my screen. I want to tell you a little about my family, because um, I just visited my father in Bulgaria, and I hope you can see my screen. This is what my dad looks like now. He's 85 years old. You can see he's gotten older. Okay, he's sitting on a bench in Bulgaria, but my dad is from a Jewish faith, okay? And he's he's done some research on my family background, and I'm going to tell you a little about it because I think it'll relate to our story. So um, going back in time, my dad had told me that there was a story about our family. Our name is Templar, by the way, okay? Templar is a British name. It is from the Knights Templar, the, the ones who, um, uh, who ran the um, uh, hotels or the hostels for Christian pilgrims in the Middle East. And they, you know, used swords to defend. They were part of the Crusades. So, so that's where my name comes from. So, 
some it's a British name, but at some point the British a British man who's a Templar went to Poland and married a Jewish woman and converted to Judaism. Okay, and that's how the Jewish Templars came to be. Well, my dad has gone backward in time to research his own genealogy, and it's interesting because when he went back far enough in time. He found, um, and it's all Jewish genealogies because they're the ones who are very big on keeping family records and cemeteries. But he found there's there's a woman without a husband's name. And she was a, um, a living around 1745 to 1790. And her name was Elka Templer. And so uh, I'm pretty sure that Elka was a Jewish woman. And there is some Templar out there from the UK who somehow met this woman and married her. Well, they had a child, and this child was called Matisyahu Templar, and he became a rabbi, and he married someone named Wittel. And then they had another child, Pinchasel Mibrigel, who again was a rabbi, who lived in, from 1800 to 1871. And then Mibrigel had a child named Joseph Joski, and he lived from 1825 to 1887. Well, Joseph Joske had a child named Aaron, who again was a rabbi, the fourth rabbi in a row. He married Ida Templer, and they lived from 1854 to 1928. Well, Aaron and, and Ida had a child named Isidore, or Isaac, who lived from 1881 to 1961. And um, uh, Isidore, um, Isidore, um, uh, Isidore, um, um, uh, Isidore Temp Templar. There was also um, uh, he married Sarah Maltz, who was the son of Pe um, uh, Peretz Maltz. Okay, and so um, uh, then Isidore. Uh, no, excuse me, I'm messing this up. Um, Isidore married Sarah Maltz, who was the son the daughter of Peretz Maltz. And they had Robert Templer, who married Lillian, excuse me, I've messed this all up. Isidore, okay, ha, was the father of Robert, okay, and I don't have his wife's name. Peretz and Sarah Maltz were the, um, the parents of Lillian Maltz, who became Lillian Templer and married um, uh, Robert Templer. Now, Robert Templer, is my grandfather and is the father of my dad, Bill. Okay, now I've kind of messed up the genealogy by stuttering a little, but um, uh, but anyway, this is the genealogy of my family. Now, there's actually photos of some of them. Over here, we have um, Aaron Templer, the rabbi, okay, who's my great-great-grandfather, with his four sons. And the second son here in the middle with the mustache is Isidore. In this picture at the far left, Isidore is at the far right, okay? And you can even see his name written. And the, at, the far, um, uh, at the far right here, this is Sarah and Peretz Maltz, who were, um, uh, who Sarah was my great-grandmother, who I've met. I, um, uh, so I never met Isidore, but I did meet Sarah. So um, uh, when, she was, when she was old. So this is my little family tree. Um, uh, who, and what happened is, these four brothers immigrated to Chicago from Poland in 1906. The rest of the, um, of the family, all the Templars who lived in Poland, stayed in Krakow, and they all died in the Holocaust under Hitler. But the ones who fled to America in 1906 survived and built, um, and built a family. So this is my dad as a younger man at the left, okay? This is him in the middle with his brother as, when he was pretty young. Here is when he's really young with my grandmother and my dad's at the right. And then here is my, um, uh, my dad with my grandfather, Bob, at a bar in Chicago. Now, Bob has an interesting story. He laundered money for the Chicago mob. He ran cinemas in Chicago, but also ran numbers. And uh, he was working with Bugsy Malone and John Dillinger, who are famous mafiosos. And so probably the money that paid for my college was mafia money that he earned. Um, uh, and uh, this is definitely when he was a mafia, a friend of the mafia himself. So people always used to joke because I'm Italian that I came from a mafia family. Actually, it was my dad's side that was mafia, sorry. 
Okay. <laughs> so moving on, this is now my family. Okay. Um, uh, you've seen this picture before, maybe this is me and Nadine. We, our kids are getting older that some of them are married. Madeline's now married to Tate. You remember Madeline. Um, uh, Esther is married to Aaron. There's Priscilla in the middle. There's Nadine with all the kids and that, no, that little dog is not a child. Okay. So, and, and there's um, a little Beth, our granddaughter, Esther and Aaron are now about to, and it's interesting that Esther married Aaron. So now my great, great grandfather and my son-in-law have the same name, but he's not a rabbi. He's a minister. So as I tell you about my family, this will tell you something, I think, because the Bible is all about genealogies. And people really cared about where they came from. And we're going to talk about Terah tonight. Terah is, is a name that many of us don't really think about in the Bible, but he is actually the first patriarch. And we're only going to read a few verses, but I think we can learn some great things from the story of Terah. And it's the beginning of the story of Joseph. And when we talk about someone, their story be begins long, long before they're born. And that's true for you, too. You are a product of the genes and of the, the upbringing that you had. And the upbringing you had is also a product of the way your parents were raised themselves. And, and even the genes and the tendencies you have are something that are hundreds of years old, okay? And they're passed down. So we're going to learn a lot by looking at Tara. So we're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter 11, verse 24. The Bible says, when Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Okay, now, this is very interesting here. First point, don't let disappointments ruin your family. So we learn in this story that Terah and his wife had three kids. Their kids' names were Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, often in the Bible, they don't list the kids in the order of their birth. They list them in the order of their importance. It's very likely Haran was the oldest. And I say this because he had a daughter, Milcah, who married Haran's brother, Nahor. Okay? And Haran died before the others did. Now, Terah himself was the son of a man named Nahor. So he probably named his second son Nahor in honor of his dad after his father had died. And his youngest child was probably Abram. And Terah probably loved playing with Haran's kids, who were his grandkids, like Lot and Milcah, okay? And, and the one who's not in this diagram is Iska. So this is a picture of the family tree. Okay, now we're going to go to the next slide. All right, so we're looking again at the family tree. So Nahor was married. He had a child called Terah, who was married. Terah had three kids, Haran, Nahor, and Abram. Now, there were four big disappointments that we can see in Terah's life. And what's interesting is you look at the patriarchs, Terah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, each of their stories has four big things in them. In the case of Terah, it was disappointments. In the case of Abraham, it was altars. In the case 
of Isaac, it was wells. In the case of Jacob, it was pillars. And in the case of Joseph, it was clothes. But let's talk about the four big disappointments in Tara's life. Okay, the first disappointment, which is something that happens to all of us, is his father, Nahor, died. And you can tell this bothered Terah a lot. He must have really loved his dad because he named his second son Nahor. And so there was a tremendous pain that all of us will face or do face already in the death of his parents. And he named his son after the memory of his father. That's his first disappointment. Second disappointment is much more difficult. His son Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans while Terah was still alive. I can't even imagine the pain of losing a child. To have a child die, and if that's happened to you, I am so sorry, but we should not see our children die. Our children should bury us. We should not bury our children. But Terah buried his child, Haran. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Third problem, is that while Haran had kids, Abram couldn't have kids. Sarai couldn't give him kids. And so Terah couldn't have any grandchildren through Sarah. It was a real disappointment. And so Terah didn't have grandkids through Abram. And Abram was a special child and yet no grandkids. And that was another disappointment for Terah. And then the last disappointment is that God called Terah, okay, to, to go to um, uh, the land of Canaan. And when he did, it says that he took Abram and he took his grandson Lot and he took Sarai, but he didn't take his son Nahor. So his family was broken up when he left and, and went towards the land of Canaan. And from the rest of the story, we can understand that Tara was deeply affected by all of these disappointments, one hurt after another. And, you know, when we look back on our lives and, and all of us are getting older, right? I mean, some of you listening, may, maybe you're in your teens, maybe you're 20 or 25, and maybe your disappointments aren't so big. OK, and I'm not saying you haven't suffered even by the age of 20. Many of us have faced some real heartache by the age of 20. I know my parents split up when I was 10, and that was a tremendous hurt and disappointment. And I had other great um, disappointments of sadness, even as a young person. But as we get older, we definitely have disappointments. And it could be the death of a loved one. It could be dreams that don't come true, okay? But the, the thing that will always happen, and the Bible, Jesus promises this, is there will be storms. And there will be disappointment. And you know, when we get sad, think about it when you're really sad. You know, what, what, what do we do? We don't want to talk to anyone. We don't want to listen to anyone. We just want to sleep or to drink and then sleep. <laughs> we don't want to give, right? And when you're overwhelmed with pain, it's hard to even talk. It's hard to do anything. But disappointments can hurt your family. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about how the disappointments in Tara's life hurt his family. But I just want us to, to think right now. Are your disappointments affecting you more than you think? Are they weighing you down? Because what we see is that Terah went, he set out to go to Canaan, it says, but he never made it to Canaan. The Bible says he settled in a place and he named the place Haran. I don't think it's a coincidence that he, um, uh, he, uh, the place was called Haran. I think he started a small little settlement and he named it after his own son. And it became known as, as the same name as the son who had died. And Terah never ended up making it past Haran. But it's clear that Terah, he, he's a small figure in the Bible. He's not really talked about much. His family was deeply hurt by the disappointments. 
And sometimes we are like zombies, the walking dead. We used to be alive. We used to be full of joy, of hope, of dreams, of excitement about life. But along the way, the pain, the failures, the mistakes, the way others have hurt us and the, way, the ways we've disappointed ourselves have worn us down. And we're still alive, but we've lost that spark. And it's because of deep, deep, deep disappointments. And this is what Tara faced. And I'm not here to make you sad about your disappointments, but I do think we need to learn from Tara. Now we're going to look at our second point. Second point is really quite similar to the first. Don't give up on your dreams. So, you know, it says, as I read before, that he took his son to set out to the land of Canaan, but they settled in Haran. And it says that they, they, um, uh, he, Terah died in Haran. And then God said to Abram, the same thing I suspect he said to his father, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And it's interesting because Terah's name means to delay, okay? And he set out from Ur, or to breathe, but he set out from Ur with Lot, but he stopped along the way. And he, he, um, he stopped in Haran, and Haran means parched or dry. He never made it to Canaan. He was full of love, but he let disappointments ruin his family. He let his grief stop him from dreaming. You know, it says in Joshua chapter 24 that Terah had worshipped other gods. You know, it's very possible that he left Ur to leave idolatry because God called him to leave the land of Ur. But God disappointed him. And when God disappointed him, the Bible, um, uh, the Bible um, uh, says that he ended up following other gods. It says in Joshua 24, 2 to 4, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abram and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. So, the Bible says that Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, worshipped other gods. And if you remember later, you're going to see again the family of Nahor, because when Isaac goes back to find a spouse, and when Jacob goes back to find a spouse, they go to Nahor's family. And in one story later, we're going to see the theft of the household gods, and Rachel hides them. But these household gods are not the Lord Almighty. It's not the God of Abraham. It is the idols of Terah that are being stolen and that are there with Rachel. who She steals the household gods of her father Laban, which in turn had come through the line of Nahor, which had come from his father, Terah. Terah was worshiping other gods and wasn't ready to, to follow the God of Israel. And yet God had given him a dream. And, you know, God gives us dreams in our life. And sometimes our dreams don't come true exactly as we intend or plan. But that doesn't mean we should give up on our dreams. You know, my wife as a child always dreamed that she would run an orphanage, believe it or not, and have lots of kids. And I praise God that we've had a chance to have lots of kids and we've had a chance to adopt kids even. And even to also start orphanages and take care of, of, of orphans. And, you know, that's a, that's a great thing. That was never my dream. But my dream was to make a difference in the world, to make the world a better place. And, you know, I thought the way I could do that was by being successful and going into politics. And I thought politicians have power, and that's power to change the world. And it's interesting because that also aligned with another dream of mine, which was to be successful and respected. So I had a kind of a worldly dream as well as a noble dream. And going into politics and, and being successful would allow me to accomplish both of those dreams. But along the way, I realized that the only way to be successful, at least in my understanding in politics would be to be a liar. And I had started lying as a young man 
as I started getting involved in politics. And so I realized that I was going to be just like every other politician. And so I gave up on that and I didn't know what I would do until God allowed me to be invited to church. And so like my ancient ancestors who were very religious, four rabbis in a row in my genealogy, I ended up coming to Christianity. And it's interesting because Isidore, my, um, uh, my father's grandfather, rejected religion because somehow he was alienated from his father, Aaron. And so he was the first one in a long line of religious people who decided to give up on religion. And when my dad was interested in becoming a, a rabbi and studying Orthi Orthodox Judaism, um, he couldn't understand why the family was so against it, especially his grandfather. And yet now I understand that my dad's grandfather was so opposed to him becoming a rabbi because he had been raised by probably a harsh rabbi, Aaron Templer, my great-great-grandfather. And so you see how we're affected so deeply by our genealogy, by what we came from, and, and in your life too. You've been affected by your past, but we can decide, despite of our past, how we're going to live. You know, my dad grew up with a dad, Bob, who, as I told you, was working with the mafia. He ran cinemas in Chicago. He was a manager of cinemas. Now, if you know anything about a movie theater, you know this. Movie theaters make their money in the evening. And so it meant that Bob was always out in the evening. And when else are movie theaters open? They're open on the weekend. So Bob was always at the theater, hanging out with the hanging out with the criminals sometimes and making sure the cinema was making money. And it meant my dad grew up without a father. My dad never learned how to be a dad. When I was 10 years old, he left. And he ended up in, of all places, Nepal in 1982. And recently... I had the chance to meet one of my dad's students, Michael Chund, who learned German from my dad in 1982. And Michael Chund was learning German just as I was getting invited to church and started in, starting to think about following Jesus halfway around the world. My dad was in Nepal, a place I would end up many, many years later. But I ended up in India only a few years after my dad had lived in Nepal and even lived in Mathura for a couple of um, for a couple of months. So it, it's very interesting how how our families go full circle. But the dreams I had of making a difference, God had a way of changing them, and I still could make a difference. But it wasn't through politics, and it wasn't even by being successful. But it ultimately was by finding Jesus. And helping people. And then I had a new dream. Oh, I'll be in the ministry. And that's how I'll make a difference. I'll be a missionary and I'll go to India. And that dream also came true, but then got broken and, and changed. And yet we should never give up on having dreams because God will adapt and change our dreams and we can do great new things. You know, you've seen that with so many of you. You are now in a new place, whether it's Brian and Janice um, uh, over there or whether it's Jacob and Bina far away from where you first were. Who would have known that um, Bina from Kerala and Jacob from Mumbai would end up in Dubai and end up making a difference in Dubai with all kinds of people? Who would have known that Bassam and Lama would end up in the UAE and not in Jordan? But God has plans. And what's so important for each of us is that we shouldn't give up on our dreams. So two points tonight, and we're going to end the lesson in just a moment. But this is the, the beginning, the foundation of this series. And, and it's the Tears of the Father is the title of the series. And you know, Tara was full of tears. He had so many disappointments, ranging from the death of his father to the early death of his son, to his daughter-in-law and son not being able to have children. And to his son, Nahor, not coming with him when he felt like it was time to go to Canaan. And these disappointments broke his family apart and broke him to the point that he, he stopped and he gave up on his dreams. He was the one God chose to go to the promised land of Canaan. God chose Terah to go to Canaan, but he stopped. And God doesn't give up. 
When when God chooses someone and they don't they don't do what God was hoping, God keeps trying. He'll find someone else. But Tara is the one who gave up on his dreams. God never gave up on Tara. So two points today. Let's think about the disappointments that have broken our heart and let's try hard to get over them. Don't let them ruin you. Don't let them define you. And don't give up on your dreams. God can still do things in your life. God can still give you joy and happiness and fulfillment, even if some of your original dreams didn't come true immediately. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark, for, for the starting the kickstarting the, the series on Tears of the Father with Tara. You know, I, I have never ever looked at Tara that way. It only appeared once. <laughs> As, as father of Abraham, and that was it for me. And Tara was done in my books of reading the Bible. But you gave us such great insights today, bro, and the two points. You know, as you were sharing about don't let disappointments ruin your life, uh, come to think of it, uh, I, I got to search my heart deeper because I think I'm disappointed of a lot of things in my life, and I don't even rea realize it. I kept telling people, you know, there's a new disease in town. It's called SD. Don't worry about COVID anymore. It's, it's, it's SD. And they say, what is SD? I say, self-denial. And, and we could be in that, not recognizing our own disappointments whilst it's there. So thank you for truly uh, showing us today, this evening, uh, through the story of Tara, the father, who had disappointments. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you, you beautifully laid it down. Thank you so much for sharing us your genealogy, actually, uh, and, and taking us back to back in history of who your family is all about. And uh yeah, I can. I try to dig down my my family tree uh, through my dad and his dad, and it only reached up to that far because nobody else remembers, uh, you know, who's who of who in the family as such. But uh, it's it's amazing what what you shared in, in the beginning. You know, uh, what our family is or was says a lot about who we are in some ways, the way we react, to the way we think, and the way we do things. And and that really led to the point of what you said: don't give up on your dreams. Uh, you know, growing up, I grew up in Mumbai. Uh, I never thought I would be in Bahrain ever. Uh, you know, when you, when you grow up in small towns, you always think about America. Uh, and then somehow God took me all the way to Dubai when I was very young. And I never dreamt of being in Bahrain. But like you said, you know, God has a purpose for each one of us. God doesn't stop dreaming or working. And he brought us to Bahrain for his purpose. And, and I'm, I'm seeing that dream that he has for me and Janice down here. Uh, and, and I could live up to his dream and have my own dreams for the ministry in Bahrain. So for me, bro, I just like to respond with that. Thank you so much for bringing to light what you shared with us today through the genealogy of, of the, Tara and, and his family tree. And I've never looked at this passage for just names for me, but you really broke it down for us to start thinking and start dreaming again. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have some time of Q&A. Uh, I posted on the chat if anybody has any questions. So we can ask a few questions to Brother Mark. And if somebody would like to respond, please raise your hand and, and we can go with that. Yeah. So, bro, uh, we have one question. Uh, it says, can you explain about the geneogram and how to stop the bad hereditary pattern? Can you explain about the geneogram and how to stop the bad hereditary pattern? Okay, that's a wonderful question. And so I didn't share one of the stories, but I hope it was implicit. And that's that, you know, my dad never had a dad. Well, I didn't have a dad either. My dad never spent time with me. He left when I was 10. And even before I was 10, there was almost no interaction. And since I was 10, I barely knew him. I have spent more time with my dad during the two times I visited him once from Dubai, I visited in February of 2017. Some of you may remember that. And I visited him this past March. Those two times, I spent about three or four full days with him. That is 90% of the time I've spent with my father in my entire life. And I got to know him a little bit just through those two visits. But I talked to my daughter and I told her about my dad, you know, and, and you know, my family knows that I don't, didn't, never knew my dad. But they said, dad, you're not like that. And you know, I'm not saying I'm a perfect dad. I know I've got to do a lot of things better, but definitely there's a generational break there where 
I was a different kind of father than my dad was to me. And I think what made all the difference, of course, was the chance to to hear the gospel and change my heart and realize that that God loved me, that I had a father in heaven. And so having a father in heaven broke the broke the pattern because I had a father who loved me. Maybe not my earthly father, okay, who I don't think knows how to love his children. But I had a father in heaven who did know how to love me. And I had examples in the church of people who were good, good husbands and good parents. And, you know, I've always known I do not know how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a good parent. Like, I know that, okay? But I've had people ranging from Moadami to so many others who are good and who I can look at and they, I can learn from them. And I think for us to break the generational pattern requires, I think, a couple of things. First of all, it's to re- we've got to realize that there's some really deep generational issues that we face. Okay, I'll give you another example. My family are, are 10 generations of Jewish people. Now, I'm, I'm part Jewish. I have nothing against Jewish people. Okay, but Jewish people have been persecuted through the centuries. And as a result, they've become very close to their families and very good with money. And it's and and even to the point where if you look up on Google, you know, to be a Jew is means to be stingy. Okay, it's a verb. And. Our family knows how to be frugal. And it's interesting because my dad, my brother, they were absolutely super, super careful with money. And I can feel that same frugality, stinginess, not willing to spend anything, okay, not caring about every rupee. And of course, many of us who come from India or other places that didn't have much money, we also know what it's like to be poor and how to be careful with money. But so I have it in my genes to be careful with money. And I have it in my family background not to be a good parent. And so I have to realize who I am based on my background and my genealogy. That, that I am, I'm someone who's not naturally going to be generous, and I'm not naturally going to be a good parent or a good friend. So you've got to realize what you are, who you are naturally. And then secondly, you've got to make a conscious effort through prayer and decision, I'm going to be different. Okay, it's just like going to the gym. You're not going to get stronger unless you exercise your muscles. And you're not going to break the generational pattern unless you make a conscious decision. I need to be a good father. You're not a good dad, but I want to be a good dad. You're not a good husband, but you need, I want to be one. And so you have to fight against your instincts. And it, if you just do what you feel like, you'll do the wrong thing. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I think that's how we break generational patterns is by really consciously realizing we have them and then fighting against them. Thank you, brother. Excellent answer. I think as as you were sharing, you know, with thoughts were going similarly. God has all the answers to break our bad habits and even hereditary situations. So thank you for that answer. Another question we have, bro, this evening is in not giving up on our dreams, how do we recognize changes and shifts by God in our dreams so we don't let disappointments consume us? A real again. And not giving up on our dreams, how do we recognize changes and shifts by God in our dreams so we don't let disappointments consume us? That's a great question. You know, the Bible talks about closed and open doors, right? It says that in Revelation, I placed before you an open door no one can shut. In Acts 16, it talks about a door being closed to go to Macedonia uh, or whatever, or got, I guess, no, Spain or wherever it was he was trying to go. And there was, an, so that, so sometimes you can think about a door and the dream is like a door and you keep trying to go through the door, but it's locked and you twist the handle. It's still locked and you shake it. It's still locked. When you have a, a dream that you're trying to open and the door doesn't come unlocked, Maybe God locked the door or maybe God has closed the door. And I I think it's not that 
you shouldn't have a dream, but maybe your your dream you're knocking at the wrong door and you should just go next door. Okay, because that's what you see even in Acts 18. Paul goes next door after he's persecuted and he finds a very open family. And so you try. And if it's clear God is blocking you, it, that could be true in a relationship. You know, you like someone and like, but they're not into you. <laughs> okay. Or maybe you try to, a job and it just doesn't work out, you know, and, and you really give your heart to it. Like my dream was to be in the ministry, full-time ministry. I love the full-time ministry. I love studying the Bible with people. I love planning churches. I love leading churches. And yet it became clear that wasn't God's plan for me. And I was like, what? <laughs> but I tried hard at it. And it became clear that the most open door for me after I lost my job in London was not to do ministry in America, but was rather to go back to India and pursue a different, a different door, a different dream, which was the dream of being in India and making a difference, but not the dream of the ministry. And so I went back to India to help the poor and to make a difference and to be with people I cared about. But it was a different dream than what I originally had, which was the dream of being in the ministry. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but God will, God will change your dreams. And, uh, you know, and then eventually I wasn't able to work, continue working for hope, not because I didn't love it, but because I couldn't take care of my family. And again, it became more and more clear. I remember when I knew that I had to stop working for hope, even though I loved working for hope. And it, it, they asked me to be part of a board meeting, okay? And I was working my heart out, raising money for hope, really doing my best. And I was part of a board meeting for Hope Worldwide. And they, they didn't realize that I was on the phone. And they started talking at a certain point about the fact they had financial challenges and who would they have to fire first? And so they started talking about different people and they even got to me. And so they, they'd forgotten I was on the call. Now, I wasn't the one they were going to fire first, but I remember that hearing them talking and realizing, you know, the people they're talking about are good people. But if there's no money to pay them, hope's going to have to let them go. And I, it became clear to me that I can't forever do what I'm doing and I need to find a different way to serve the Lord. And so I knew that day I've got to find a new career. And this is going to be hard because I'm 45 years old and I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> so, but but God was showing me that a door was closing. But at the same time, God was opening another door because he he introduced me to a friend, Andy, who told me I could work for the government. And I looked into it and I could. So So anyway, that's a long answer. But the point I'm making is when when doors are being slammed in your face, maybe that's a sign that you need to find a different door. Thank you, bro. Uh, one more question. Uh, perhaps there's a couple in there. You know, sometimes we are we are good at hiding disappointments and carry uh, carry on as normal around other people. You know, how do we recognize it within ourselves and others, especially in the church? That's such a good question. I think we have to listen sympathetically and empathetically without judging or diagnosing. I think we often don't know what's disappointed us. And we don't also know what's disappointed others. And Job's friends sat with him and were quiet. That was good. But when they started talking, not so good. His heart was broken. He needed someone to listen to him, not to lecture him. So I think we don't know what our disappointments are, what our hurts are. And I don't think I know all my disappointments and hurts or even how I feel about everything, right? I don't, I don't think I've processed it all. But I think if we have friends who are willing to sit with us and if we pray, God will make it more and more clear. And sometimes you'll, you'll realize what your disappointments are in a, way, in a very strange way. For example, there'll be a song playing on the radio and you'll start crying. And you'll realize it's because the lyrics of the song say exactly what you feel. Or you see a movie and it really affects you. 
again, because one of the characters may, is going through what you really feel. So th there are many ways we can discover our feelings. Bro, you shared about, uh, and, and point number one, about uh, Tara's disappointing hurt, hurting his family. How did it hurt his family? Well, that's a good question, and maybe I should explain that more. In different ways, I think. I think that um, uh, he had a dream to go to Canaan, the promised land. And he took Abram and Lot and everybody with him. And then he built a village in honor of his dead son, you know, and he never moved on. And he could never leave the grief, the deep, deep, deep grief of having lost Haran. And I saw this in my family in Italy. You know, when I grew up, I had a third cousin whose names were Marcella, Cristiana, and Silvia. Gabriele and Zazetta were their parents, and Tina was Zazetta's sister. Well, when I was going to college, Cristiana got cancer. And she was about 19 years old, wonderful young lady, and she died of cancer. I mean, just a tremendous tragedy. And it just broke her parents' heart. And in their house for the rest of their lives until they died, and Zazetta just died three weeks ago at age 92, they had a wall with pictures of Christiana just decorating their apartment. I mean, much more prominent than the living children was the shrine to Christiana in their home. Her death was a shadow over their family for their entire lives. And I think that Tara was deeply, deeply broken by his son's death to the point that he didn't, it, it consumed him. Now, again, I'm speculating. We don't have strong evidence, but we know he named a town after Haran and he didn't make it to Canaan. Um, we, we see that, we see that um, he took Lot with him. He must have cared about his grandkids, but he didn't get a grandkid from Abram and Sarai. And that must have been a, a deep sadness to him. Again, you we're guessing, but this affected who he was. Okay. Um, he named his son after his dead dad. And maybe he was always talking about, yeah, I remember my dad. And you look like dad. And maybe Nahor was one of his favorites. And maybe that's why Nahor ended up in idolatry, is that there was favoritism towards Nahor because Nahor is the one he named after his dad. You know um, we don't know all the ways that his disappointments hurt his family, because I don't want to accuse him falsely. <laughs> but what we do know is that he didn't become a man of impact in the scriptures, and God had clearly wanted him to be one. And, and that deeply hurt his family, and we know he was idolatrous. And this, this clinging to false gods, even though the true God had called him, clearly we, we turn to false gods because of disappointment, okay? And that's true for our life. Certainly, I know when I sin, it's often because I'm sad. And I'm just, I'm, you know, and, and sin is comforting. False gods are comforting. They're encouraging. And yet, they, they always hurt us. Bro, thank you so much for that answer. It was pretty clear. Uh, I think we'll conclude the evening tonight. Brother Mark Templer, thank you once again so much for being with us, for giving us your time. And, and, and for the first session, I hope it's been encouraging to all the listeners this evening and also insightful on, on the story of Tara and his disappointments and his dreams. So I'd encourage each one of us to, you know, truly, truly search our hearts deeper. What's really weighing us down? Is it our disappointments or is it the dreams that we stop dreaming about? So let's give a hand to our brother Mark Temple once again. Uh, we'll close up in word of prayer. Yeah, so let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for brother Mark Templer for taking us through the life of Tara, 
and his disappointments and his broken dreams. Father, help us to truly, truly dig deeper into hearts through your scriptures, Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit, to, to be able to identify what our disappointments are in our life that are weighing us down for advancing further in your kingdom, to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. What are the dreams that we stop dreaming for, for your ministry, Lord, here, wherever we have been placed in the Gulf or whichever part of the world we are right now. So, Father, give us a heart. Give us a mind to truly uh, dream big things for the ministry, uh, Father, for your glory alone, not for us. And Father, it was interesting to hear about the, the life Brother Mark Templer has lived himself and, and the dreams that he's had and how some of the disappointments have weighed him down. And Father, help us to learn from one another, how we may continue to encourage one another uh, and to dream bigger dreams uh, and to Father overcome the disappointments that are there in our life. And surely we are disappointed every single day something or the other in our relationship and at work with our kids with our friends even at church with brothers and sisters but help us to look beyond that as to how we can continue to love you and to serve you father we pray for each one who's present here this evening that we have a good night rest uh and whoever's not here we pray that they can join us next week thank you for the great line we had off the internet today without any disturbance we're grateful for your many blessings of our lives we love you lord in jesus name i pray amen, amen.